Modern China is an economic juggernaut, a global center of industry and trade. But China at the end of the Civil War in 1949 was anything but that. Largely agrarian with little domestic industry to speak of, Mao was the communist leader of a country which Karl Marx would have rejected out of hand as a candidate for his workers' revolution. To correct this, several transformative programs were undertaken to catapult China into the modern world and convert it into a global superpower. These attempts at modernization were met with mixed results at best. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at the first major communist Chinese modernization program as well as the repercussions that resulted from it. Today, we are going to take a great leap forward. This is the Cold War. To properly frame the great leap forward, we need to talk about some of the actions that Mao and the communists took in the years after their coming to power. The transformation and modernization of China was going to be an all-encompassing affair, touching all spheres of life. In the realm of agriculture, Mao stripped wealthy landowners of their property and redistributed the land to the peasantry. Three years later, this land was then taken away from the peasantry and collectivized along Stalinist lines. 1954 saw agricultural cooperatives formed, gathering together up to 300 households per cooperative. But Mao's reforms were not aimed at strictly economic transformation. He also aimed at moving Chinese society into the modern age and began to take steps to break cultural practices deemed inconsistent with a modern communist society. Foot binding and child marriage were firmly outlawed. 1958 saw the abolishment of private property. 1957 introduced the anti-rightist campaign designed to stamp out any dissent or opposition to communist party and their actions. Primarily, although not exclusively, focused on suppressing intellectuals who still supported capitalistic ideas and policies or were opposed to collectivization, the anti-rightist campaign officially saw about 550,000 people persecuted, although that number could have been as high as 2 million in reality. The campaign was most responsible for consolidating the power of the CCP in China and firmly establishing the one-party state. So, what was the net effect of all this? Well, the general takeaway by Mao and the communist leadership was that they were largely successful in their aims. Scholars have then argued that the confidence this gave them made them overestimate their power to implement further, more radical reforms in a very short time. Mao was quite taken by Khrushchev's pledge that the Soviet Union would overtake the US in its relative economic power and production capabilities and naturally wanted to set a similar goal for China. So Mao pledged that China would overtake the United Kingdom in steel production within 15 years. Of course, this was an unreasonable target given that China was a country whose economy consisted of 90% agriculture and had little infrastructure or expertise on which to build. But the heart wants what the heart wants, and Mao wanted industrialization. The plan that was laid out was set to utilize one of China's advantages, its large population. The plan was to mobilize the people to build roads and industrial facilities while retaining some of these people to work in the new industries being created. This would need to be done while also expanding the collectivization process to ensure enough food was being produced to feed the industrial workers. This would be a good place to point out Mao's plans were considered totally unachievable by all of the economists and advisors around Mao, but the chairman's nearly delusional overconfidence won the day. If you want an example of that delusional thinking, consider this. Mao aimed to double steel production in 1957 alone, from 5.35 million tons to 10.7 million tons. Good luck with that. So, the Great Leap Forward was announced in January of 1958 at a party meeting in Nanjing. The plan was to engage peasants in the modernization process by organizing them into communes which would make it easier to plan their labor, eliminate waste, and therefore increase economic and industrial production. Of course, cheap labor was really at the heart of the plan. Keep in mind that in 1958, the collectivization process in the countryside was underway, but was by no means complete. Some senior party officials, including Zhao Wanlai and Liu Shaoqi, urged caution with the pace of forced collectivization, 
but 1958 saw the acceleration of the process in order to keep in line with Mao's dictates. April of 1958 saw a new type of commune established at Chayashan in Henan province. Here, all private property was abolished. Private land holdings, plots, household tools, it was all collectivized. Men, women, and children were separated from each other, each staying in communal buildings. Yes, even the children, who became more like children of the commune instead of of their families. A military-like regime was established, where people were forced to work long hours and eat in communal kitchens. As more of these special communes were established across the country, competitions were created between them in an effort to ensure high levels of production were being met. Of course, these communes were also designed to break down one of the traditional pillars of Chinese society, the family. Breaking up the family unit and replacing it with the state was part of the plan to create a new China. That being said, there was little incentive for the peasants to try and meet the unrealistic quotas being set for them. Wages and money, a traditional incentive, were abolished and replaced by work points, which were given for good work and good behavior. Strict discipline was also used as incentive. By the end of 1958, 26,000 of these communes had been established in order to not only produce enough food for the growing urban workers, but also to be exported to other socialist countries to further foster international brotherhood. But, and there's always a but, but the increasing number of urban workers was making the task of maintaining and even increasing agricultural output more difficult. More investment was being assigned to industrial development as part of the Great Leap Forward. This resulted in over 21 million more people being added to work on non-agricultural, state-sponsored work. Lack of investment coupled with fewer agricultural laborers and more mouths to feed is not a good combination. And what about those new industrial workers? Well, given that they had little to no experience in working in an industrial environment, they too proved to be ineffective. To help bolster industrial production numbers, agricultural workers still on the countryside were given orders that they should, quote, walk on two legs, meaning that they should not only work in agriculture, but also in industry by building backyard furnaces to help make iron and steel. This was all done to help fulfill the absurd goal that Mao had set to beat the UK in steel production. The backyard furnaces were to be used to smelt scraps of iron, such as old farming tools, and even household items like cooking utensils. So, have any of you ever tried to actually smelt iron? It takes a lot of heat. Since coal was in short supply, these backyard furnaces were being fired by wood. The resulting environmental devastation came on two fronts. Not only was the air heavily polluted by smoke from the fires, but huge swaths of forest were cleared for firewood. And the cherry on top? Well, the iron and steel being produced from these furnaces was all but useless due to impurities and issues with the smelting process. It's almost like making iron and steel is something that requires some skill and know-how and can't just be done in your backyard. Weird, I know. The furnace project was soon abandoned. The Great Leap Forward also resulted in a massive transformation of urban landscapes. In an effort to harvest nutrients for soil and to obtain building materials for other new projects, there are estimates that between 30 and 40% of buildings in China were demolished. This is actually considered the greatest demolition of property in human history. And now, one of the more curious aspects of the Great Leap Forward, the Smash the Sparrows campaign. Sparrows were considered to be detrimental to crop growth, and so a campaign to destroy the birds was begun. The entire populace was mobilized to help kill the birds, often with one group of people making loud noises by striking pans together to scare the birds into flight, and then another group involved in shooting them as they flew away. The Smash the Sparrows campaign was actually highly successful as long as you only look at the numbers of dead sparrows. With the sparrow population decimated, insects, lacking one of their major predators, infested crops and destroyed entire harvests. Agricultural output actually decreased as a result. The situation was only really rectified after 250,000 sparrows were imported from the Soviet Union in order to restore some balance to nature. So, that was how the Great Leap Forward was implemented. And the results? Well, disaster may very well be an understatement. 
So let's take a look. The 1958 harvest was blessed by favorable weather, and crop yields were plentiful. But with so many peasants being forced to work in industry instead of in agriculture, it actually became impossible for it all to be harvested, and much of it rotted in the fields. Government officials, however, wanted to look good, exaggerated the figures of food collected in their reports to the commune leaders, and the commune leaders, in turn, exaggerated their reports to the communist leadership, all in hopes of obtaining favors and promotions. So, the central government, based on the figures provided in the reports, set amounts of each harvest to be collected for redistribution to the cities. On paper, the amounts set were relatively realistic, but due to the false reporting, once the government had collected the foodstuffs, it left next to nothing for the peasants to eat, and starvation began to set in. This artificially created famine resulted in millions of deaths, and conditions were terrible. There were even reports of cannibalism, and people struggled to merely survive. Industrial production was affected, as people who can't eat also can't work except that the party demanded its quotas be met, and workers were forced to work torturous and inhumane hours to make up shortfalls. Lower-level party officials tried to inform the central government of the conditions in the countryside, but their pleas fell on deaf ears, as Mao and the leadership were already well aware of the famine. At a March 1959 Politburo meeting, Mao stated that it was better for half the people to die so that the other half could eat. In July of 1959, the Communist Party held the Lushan Conference, whose aim was to analyze the events of 1958 and to propose corrections for the Great Leap Forward. Mao had stepped down as state chairman in April, but remained chairman of the party. In a surprise move, the defense minister, Peng Dehuai, himself a decorated general of the Civil War, made harsh criticisms of the Great Leap Forward and of the wasting of natural resources and manpower as well as the inflated production claims that were exacerbating the disaster. Peng's position, outlined in a letter that was meant to remain private, but was circulated by Mao himself, garnered a great deal more support in the party leadership than Mao anticipated. Perceiving the letter as a personal attack, Mao dug in in his defense of the Great Leap Forward, and he decided to pursue the plan further. Peng was fired from his position and put under house arrest, being banished from public life. He was later targeted by the Red Faction during the Culture of Revolution, but that is a story for another episode. The rest of 1959 and 1960 saw no relief for the people of China, but instead for their hardships. Unlike the plentiful harvest of 1958 that was left to rot in the fields, the harvests in the next two years were plagued by drought and the resulting poor harvests worsened the overall situation. To try and ameliorate things, New experiments were carried out, even though they often lacked any scientific merit or backing in their effectiveness. Agricultural methods promoted by the Soviet scientist, Tromifo Lysenko, were actively promoted and used, despite a lack of any evidence towards their effectiveness in increasing crop yields. Included in some of the practices used was the concentrated sowing of seeds and deep plowing of the soil, as well as other techniques which actually harmed agricultural output, making the famine even worse than it already was. So all quite disastrous, right? Well, let's add something else to the mix. Despite the famine, Mao was insisting on continuing food shipments abroad. These shipments were being used as a form of foreign debt payment to the Soviet Union, as well as other communist countries, even making those payments ahead of schedule. It was a way for Mao to promote the image abroad that China was a strong and prosperous nation. Food aid was offered to China by Japan, but it was rejected. Okay, so with Mao no longer in day-to-day -day control of the country, having been succeeded by Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, the energies being committed to the Great Leap Forward slowly began to fade, and by 1962, it had largely ended as a program. Mao's role in the disastrous plan led him to take a much more passive role especially following the Lushan Conference. By the time of the 1962 7,000 Cadres Conference, Mao's policies were being openly criticized, and it was even stated that the famine had been created as a result of human error. Mao would remain largely sidelined until 1967 and the Cultural Revolution. 
Although the policies of the Great Leap Forward had been stopped, the damage was more than done. Between 1958 and 1962, anywhere between 50 million and 55 million people died in China as a result of famine, torture, summary execution, suicide, and disease. Forests were decimated and buildings demolished. Agriculture was ruined. Grain consumption between 1957 and 1961 saw a drop of 22%, while the consumption of pork in the same time period fell by a massive 72%. Data showed that there was more livestock in Henan province in 1940, in the middle of the war against Japan, than there was in 1961. Officially, the Chinese Communist Party acknowledged the mistakes of the Great Leap Forward, but still lauded the period for its revolutionary spirit. This disastrous period of modern Chinese history is one of death and suffering, all in the name of forced progress. It was based on the ideas that ideological and revolutionary fervor would be enough to grow an economy and transform it into a powerhouse. Sadly for the Chinese people, this is not the last time that these ideas would be used to try and revolutionize Chinese culture. But that is a story for another day. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode, but to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have removed any and all sparrows from the vicinity of the bell button. I'm sure there won't be any adverse effects. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at thecoldwartv. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. And don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it gets heated. <laughs>